This lens from SLR Magic, this tiny, tiny lens, is probably my favorite micro four thirds lens in my collection. Are you surprised? I mean, on paper, it doesn't sound all that impressive. It's manual focus and it's maximum aperture. The widest it can open up is f4. And yet you're more likely to find this lens on my camera than any other lens. Let me get a disclaimer out of the way. I bought this lens with my own money. I've been using it for about a year. Nobody's paying me to make this review and nobody's giving me any free stuff. All right, let me tell you the story about how I got this lens. I originally bought it for vlogging because the kit lens that came with my camera is a 14 to 140 millimeter zoom, not super high quality and also bulky and heavy. So initially I thought, you know what? I need the lightest lens possible. I, I need like a pancake lens. And so Panasonic has a, a pancake lens, 14 millimeter, which is, it's like the size of a lens cap almost. And that's uh, in full frame equivalent, that's like a 28 millimeter lens. So that turned out to be perfect from a weight standpoint, but from a focal length standpoint, it was a little bit too in your face. I mean, a 28 millimeter equivalent full frame is, is kind of close for arm's length. And also the lens didn't focus very closely. So if I needed to get a detail shot, I, I couldn't get in as close as I wanted. And also the Panasonic GH series is not famous for, shall I say, being able to autofocus at all. I mean, it's pretty bad. So this lens was just going in and out of focus and couldn't really focus close enough. So it wasn't working out. I needed something wider. I needed something where I didn't have to worry about focusing and I didn't want to spend a lot of money. Now I knew from my years as a professional photographer that a wide angle lens has massive depth of field. And if you have a wide enough lens, then you really almost don't need autofocus at all. You can just kind of set it for the general distance of your subject and then leave it there. So that made the SLR Magic lens a real contender because it's almost as light as the pancake lens and the price, I mean, 200 bucks, you can't go wrong there. And its focal length is eight millimeters, which is full frame equivalent 16 millimeters. Definitely wide enough for vlogging. In fact, I even can crop in if I need to, if I'm doing shooting 4K. So I found it perfect for vlogging. In fact, I even once hiked an eight mile hike up a mountain using this lens, my GH4, on a gimbal the entire way. Of course, just talking about the focal length doesn't really help you visualize it. So I'm gonna compare it to some common other focal lengths. Here is a shot from the Panasonic 14 millimeter pancake lens. Here is a shot from my iPhone 10. Now this is a shot from the SLR Magic eight millimeter lens. By the way, I biffed it and I accidentally left the aperture on F16. So it's a little dark, but you can still get a sense of the focal length. And here are some shots from the GoPro Hero 8. This is in linear mode, and this one is in super view. Did you notice with the GoPro 8 super view mode, all the lines were curved? Well, that barrel distortion is pretty typical of fisheye lenses. Did you also notice that the SLR Magic lens had all straight lines? That's because it's a rectilinear lens, which is just a, a fancy way of saying all your rectangles are straight. Even when you compare other eight millimeter lenses in a micro four thirds format, uh, not all of them are rectilinear. Some of them are fisheye where they have those curving lines. Now with a fisheye, you might get a wider field of view, but you won't have straight lines. And I generally prefer my lines to be straight. I did some sharpness testing with this lens and I'm pretty impressed with how it held up. I tested at F4, F8, F16, and uh, the edges, you know, they remain pretty sharp. On inferior lenses, you often get some softness or lack of sharpness on the edges, especially when you open up the aperture all the way, but I didn't see that here. I also did a vignette test where I just took uh, pictures of a blank wall. And um, if you bump up the contrast, you can see that there's a little bit of vignetting. And I was a little surprised to see that the vignetting actually was there at, at all apertures, but it's pretty mild. You can adjust for that in post and, and quite frankly, I don't adjust for it because I like a little darkening at the edges. It's not so much that you actually notice it. 
All right, so let's talk about some of the quirks with this lens, and I mean beyond the manual focus part. The, the, the biggest quirk, I think, is this little screw on the side here. This is the focus locking, and that's not just a convenience, it's really a necessity. The, the way the lens is built, the focus ring is not isolated mechanically from the rest of the lens, so if you turn the front of the lens, you're focusing. If you adjust the aperture, you're focusing. If you bump it, you're focusing. So it's you really need to lock that down. The good news is that with this lens, you're probably picking a focus distance and then you're just gonna stick with that. And you know, you get in the habit of just unlock, adjust, lock, and then, then you're good. The lens comes with a clear protective filter on the front and um, SLR Magic warned me, keep this on the lens. The, uh, the actual front element of the lens apparently is very susceptible to scratching, so you wanna protect it. You know, this uh, softbox really brings out the fact that I need to clean this thing a little bit. This lens is advertised as a cine lens, which means it's made specifically for film and video. Now. The definitions of a cine lens vary, but uh, to me, five things come to mind. First, all cine lenses are manual focus. And if you think about it, no expensive film production is gonna rely on a camera's autofocus and just hope that they nail it because that's just too risky. Second, a cine lens is going to have a de-clicked aperture ring. And what that means is if you turn the aperture ring, it's not gonna go click, click, click into the different f-stops. It's gonna move smoothly between them. Now, a photographic lens if it's got an aperture ring at all, it's gonna click between like, you know, f2.8, f4, and you can't kind of put it in the middle. So the, uh, the SLR Magic lens, it does that. And third, most cine lenses are marked in T-stops rather than F-stops. Now, what's the difference? They're kind of the same thing. I mean, they work the same way. Um, I'm gonna oversimplify here, so if you know what these are, don't get annoyed, okay? Um, an F-stop is like, like, like what it would be in a perfect world, how much light the lens would let in. Whereas a T-stop is a practical real world, real number. So like if the lens, you know, doesn't let in as much light as it theoretically should, the T-stop is, is accurately saying, yes, it lets this amount of light in. What that does, it allows you to pull off a lens. You know, if you have a lens set to F, um, F5.6 and you pull that one off and put on a different focal length lens at FF, 5.6, you're gonna be letting in exactly the same amount of light. That consistency is really important. So, SLR magic, F-stops or T-stops? I don't know, it doesn't tell me. And quite frankly, you only have three markings on here, four, eight, and 16. And the ring is so small, you are you can't really dial anything in super exact. So I think the point of whether it's F-stop or, or T-stop is kind of moot here. Another common aspect of cine lenses is that they tend to have the markings on the side of the lens rather than on the top of the lens. And the reason for that is in, in when you're making a film, there's often a focus puller whose, whose job is to just set the focus and they need to be able to see that on the side of the camera. Whereas for a photographic lens, the photographer is the one who's setting it and they tend to look down on the camera. So for the SLR Magic, the markings are on the top. And finally, cine lenses typically have geared teeth on them. And the purpose of this is so that you can put a follow focus rig on it. And that's basically a big knob with a gear so that you can adjust the, the uh, focus and, and do fine tuning. And that's actually what the focus puller would be turning to adjust the, the lens. Now. This lens has teeth on it, but they're way too small. And so I reached out to SLR Magic to find out what was going on. Now I gotta commend SLR Magic for their customer service. Every time I've reached out to them, I've gotten a real human responding, usually very quickly. So this time when I, I emailed them about the, the small gears and maybe there was like a miniature follow focus rig or something like that, and their uh, senior project planning manager got back to me. And I got an interesting history of this lens. This eight millimeter lens was originally designed to work with the DJI Inspire drone, the first version, which is no longer in production. According to SLR Magic, it was the first third-party lens that was light enough and well-balanced enough to work on that drone. Later, the lens was repurposed for general use. You sometimes find cinematographers using it as part of a crash cam. In other words, a camera that they might put on a car that they know is gonna crash. They would pair it with maybe a, a Z Cam E series. And uh, so then you have something light and cheap that you don't mind, uh, you know, getting broken. And of course, vloggers like it because it's light and uh, it's wide angle and it's got a massive depth of field, which, which is why I bought it. But about those geared teeth, now 
No follow focus, that wasn't ever the intention. That's just so you can grip it with your fingers. One pleasant surprise about this lens is its minimum focus distance. Uh, it will focus as close as 10 centimeters from the focal plane, which is about four inches. And what that equates to is that's about three and a half centimeters in front of the actual lens element or about an inch. The lens also creates some cool artifacts when you uh, hit it with some bright lights. I love the ring it makes around points of light like the sun. And if you stop it down to f16, you get these cool sun stars. And you can, of course, use the lens for photography as well. And it, it's great for landscapes. It's particularly good for architecture because you've got all those straight lines. Now, is this the best eight millimeter lens for micro four thirds that you can buy? No, no, it's not. But it's got so much going for it. If you can adapt to some of its quirks, it's incredibly versatile. They didn't skimp on the important parts, like it's a sharp lens, uh, it's, it's rectilinear, and it's not heavy, and you're saving money because it doesn't have autofocus. But for a lens this wide, again, you probably don't need it. I'm sure you're very surprised, shocked even, to find that I've dropped an affiliate link down below. Go check it out, go read about it. You don't have to buy one, just, you know, take a look. All right, I'm Matt Haynes. Thanks for stopping by. See you in the next video. Stop.